that's 12. 12 kilos. So that's 3G. I think these might be okay. 12.3. I think I'm just going to go with these ones. Hello. At the end of the last video, I was getting concerned about the strength of this bit here. And I put, I think it was 2 kilos or something on here. And I said that that was like a, a 1.2G load or something like that. Turns out my calculation was wrong. That was only about 0.6G. So I decided I would just make these all over again, this section, and because I've glued it into here, make another one of those as well. And I started doing that, and my new design was going to be like this, so there's no holes, like those uh, lightning holes, we're not having those anymore. As I was cutting this on the machine, the CNC machine, I started to not really like it that much, and this bit here also, I originally thought oh, this was a great idea, but now I think it's kind of dumb. Um, so the idea is that there's going to be a piece of carbon in there to strengthen that bit that was like the, the worst problem area. Um, and then to top things off, on the second one I did a bit of an oopsie there and I cut right through that bit there where the strength has to be the, the strongest. And I don't have any more wood to do this right now. So yeah, I was just really not liking that too much. And I thought in the meantime, why don't I stress test this a bit more now that I've got my calculations correct. So I put 12 kilos on this point here, which is a 3G loading. Uh, I didn't really feel too comfortable with going too much more. Although I, I, I feel like it could have gone to 3.5 before I'd start to get really, really concerned. But anyway, that gave me a lot more confidence in what we have here already. So I'm kind of thinking I might just go with this. flap is never going to go this far. I just want to make absolutely sure that it's not going to get jammed against here. Here's how that vent gap at the back looks. Seals up quite nicely when it closes. So there's no, there's no gap along there now. But with even just a little bit of opening flap, it does open. Okay, now this hole in that bit there has to be in the same place as it rotates. It looks like it's pretty much in the same place. Okay, so I have glued those spar pieces into the outer wings, so there's no going back now. We've, <laughs> we've committed to that. And uh, at the end here, I've put a little bit of glass on here just to make it easier, because I'll be able to hold this while I'm glassing the rest of it now. Okay, it's time to glue the horizontal stabilizer pieces onto the tail now. And to save myself some frustration, I spent some time making this little jig on the CNC machine. So it's just the negative or the, the bottom side of these and that lets me place them in here and they're going to be perfectly positioned relative to each other and they'll keep this nice straight edge and the yaw rotation will be correct and everything and I can set up this tail here making sure that that front edge which is supposed to be vertical is vertical and then use another square here to make sure that this is vertical and then uh, I know that the bottom of this big piece of foam that this is all sitting on if I put that flat to the table, then this <laughs> is going to be in the right orientation, 90 degrees and everything to that. Um, so this will just give me a bit more peace of mind, because the way I do this um, is I first tack it on with Gorilla Glue, and the Gorilla Glue puffs up, right? So you have to kind of hold the thing that you're gluing together in position properly. And I've done that, done that in the past by using tape and stuff, but... It's just a little bit frustrating and it always worries me that it's not going to work properly. Obviously I'm going to have to cut out that central section there. So there's a bit of a V here that's going to have to be removed. And then this will also need to be lifted up a certain amount to get it into the right place. So here we go, all stuck together with the tail all finished now. Um, it's looking pretty good. Uh, the wing joiners are the next thing to do there and at the moment it's just under 5.2 kilos that's with the motors are on there all the servos are on but there's no wiring to anything so there's no wiring going inside this wing from from that servo to the center and there's obviously no flight controller and no battery or ESCs 
So I think we'll be able to keep it under six kilos, but the five kilo mark has definitely been overshot. Hmm, looks like it might have ended up with not quite enough angle of incidence in the wing. So if I squat down like this, the twist is fairly pronounced at the wingtip. Maybe a little bit too much, actually. And then the angle of the motors and the angle of the horizontal stabilizer are supposed to be the direction of flight, like straight forwards. So the bottom of the wing there, oh, don't do that. Oh, don't, oh, oh, we can see, <laughs> we can see here the dihedral. It'd be nice if it would just go back to where it was a second ago. But anyway, the underside surface of the wing, we can just have a look at it there. It's actually sloping slightly downwards toward the front. It's probably not quite what we want. I think we'd want that to be at least level, wouldn't we? But it's not so far out of whack that it's going to be a problem, I don't think. Okay, it's time to do something about attaching this wing pieces together. And to be honest, this is what's been holding up this project. Uh, kind of got stalled with trying to figure out a good way to do it. So that's why this video has taken so long. And there are a whole bunch of ideas swimming around in my head, and none of them I really liked. But uh, after a couple of months, I figured I'd just better do something. So this is the least dislikable solution that I could come up with. And the issue is that while this prong is quite strong in that direction, uh, it needs to be very securely held in because as soon as it slips out a bit or instead of contacting all the way along here You end up just contacting with this corner and that base edge there and I don't think that's going to be very good Plus I, I tested it up to 3G, but I would rather the whole thing go up to 4G And I just got the feeling that it might not quite take 4G load on its own So I wanted to also have a little bit of strength um, coming from Oh, it's nice and light, that's good. Blowing in the wind a bit. Um, so I wanted to have a little bit extra strength coming from somehow from the join. And the idea that I've come up with is a little bit wacky maybe, but uh, I wanted it to be fairly easy to assemble, so uh, rather than having to fumble around with nuts on both sides, I wanted to have a captive nut inside, and I obviously didn't want it to stick up too much, although it is going to stick up a little bit. So the way it works is we have a cavity cut out there, three along the edge of the wing and inside there there's a three millimeter nylock hex nut held captive in there and I'm going to glue this onto there obviously so this piece of FR4 is going to contact with this fairly strong piece of glass here so the idea is to continue this stress uh, what do you call it the strength coming from these fibers here it's a real shame that they suddenly stop here and right next door, on the other side of the wing, there's some more nice strong fibers going that way. So I'm just trying to connect those together so that that break no longer really exists. Anyway, that will, that will glue in there. And then on the other side of the wing here, I'm going to build up some fiberglass that's going to overlap. There's also a little bit of dihedral in this. It's only 3 degrees, so that's the reason that I didn't want to have a piece of FR4 crossing this gap. It would be easier to build up fiberglass and get it in the perfect um, bend. To, to match everything. So that will go over the top of this disc, uh, not, not sticking to it obviously. So I'll put some, put some glad wrap or something in between so they don't stick. And then on top of that, I will, sorry about the shadows, then I will glue this onto the top of the fiberglass that's built up over here and that nut there will have the threads drilled out of it. So it's just going to be a three millimeter hole in the middle of there um, so that the idea is that you want to have steel on steel and I didn't fancy having the threads of these screws directly contacting the FR4 because over time that would wear them down but I think if there's that much steel contacting the FR4 instead I think that that will be right. but the nice thing about doing it this way is that um, when this is when the glue is curing for that final glue up the bolts will already be in there and tightened and holding everything into the perfect position. 
So I'm really hoping that that will mean that this spro uh, prong or whatever you call that is not going to be able to slip even a tiny bit that way. So that's what I'm doing today and uh, also have to figure out a way to get that hatch to sit in there nicely with some magnets or something. But first, since it's such a beautiful day and we've had precious few of those lately, I'm going to spend some time flying that over there. Wow, the perfect lawn dart. <laughs> oh gee, oh my goodness, now that was really stuck in there. Looks like the only thing that broke was that spar. So assuming the motor still goes if I, after I clean it. Oh, it looks like this also delaminated here. This is broken a bit, and then crunched there. So there are a few other dents and delaminations like that. But it looks like the biggest damage is actually the receiver, which the case of it's all got crunched here. But more importantly, the antennas both got ripped off somehow. Not sure how that would have happened because this was at the back. So the only way that could have happened is from its own weight getting thrust, like shoved forward. Seems like a lot of damage just for that. That that would have been enough to break the antennas, but I can't see that cracking the case. And that's really cracked. Check this out. The ailerons on Twin Hopper are not that much smaller than the entire wingspan of that um, Nano Goblin ripoff that I made a while ago. And these outer sections of the twin hopper wing have 1.8 meters wingspan, so they're actually slightly larger than the OG Talon wingspan, which is 17 20 millimeters or so. Looks like the wing area is probably not too much different, though. There's quite a fat cord on this Talon. To get this hatch to sit in there and stay in there, I'm just going to use four magnets and I've glued them in here so that they're flush with that surface with Yoohoo Pour and a little bit of packing tape on top. And uh, you need to make sure that there's a draft angle there so that this, this can pull out easily, which is what I did when I was cutting it with the uh, jigsaw blade before. And now that I have those magnets in there, well, if I was to put this in here now, it would fall down below the surface because the thickness of the jigsaw blade um, makes this piece too small. But if I just try and pick up these magnets here, like that, so that now there's a magnet stuck on it on there. Now it's going to be ever so slightly too large. So if I put it in there, it's just going to be sticking up a little bit. But because the foam is squashy on the inside there, I can push it down to get it to the perfect position and what I'll do is I'll put some uh, epoxy microspheres around the outside there and put a piece of plastic wrap on the back of this before I put it in and uh, on the other so that the plastic wrap is in between the magnets of course so that's where the plastic wrap goes on like that and then uh, blobs of epoxy microspheres around there hopefully kind of in the right place I'm in a bit of a hurry because I wasn't planning to do this right now, but I thought I might try and use the same mix of epoxy as I was using to do that. I had just enough left over. Uh, so, yeah, and in there I put some baking paper so it doesn't drip down there. And then some sellotape or packing tape so that it doesn't fall. Uh, like, we don't have too much stuff overhanging because it's a real bitch to sand this or cut it. And I don't want to have any excess, really. I want to go down at the front much. Shit. Come on. So that's how that turned out. And I think it's going to be okay. Ended up a little bit more in here than I wanted because I sanded off some of the edge of the lid to be 
like there's a big open gap there now. Um, and these magnets stuck in there quite nicely. The biggest problem I'm having now is that the ones in here seems like Yuhu Pour is not very good for metal. Um, I'm not happy with the way those are sticking in. I took the cell tape off so that it could dry out properly, but there's still a bit sort of squishy feeling. So I'm going to use some five minute epoxy to glue those back in properly. And I have marked them, of course, so that I don't get them backwards. And then to be able to pull this uh, hatch off, you're going to have these things here like that sticking through that slot and going through the other side. Alright, so these little discs are all stuck in there now and I've covered them over with packing tape here so that no epoxy can stick onto there anymore. And I'm going to stick the wing on and then make a little bridging piece with um, fiberglass like that. I was originally thinking to just make small pieces to go across here only because that's really the only place you need it for keeping the strength continuous. But that would be a little bit fiddly to cut all those little pieces and also it's already kind of bumpy like this. And I thought rather than making it even more bumpy, I'll just put a larger piece kind of like that over from the front to the back and hopefully that will sort of make it a little bit more smoother um, surface like that. Okay so those are all glued up and ready to cure now and I put a bit of peel ply on the disc areas there because that's where the next piece is going to have to stick on. I'm not going to stick that on now because I need to wait for this to cure so I can drill a hole in what I just laid up there. Because it's fiberglass we can see through it which is really nice so I'll get the hole in the right place. Although it doesn't have to be perfectly correct, uh, it just needs to be you know, pretty much in the right place. And then when the screw goes in with the uh, like nut washer kind of thing, it will go in the right place anyway when the next glue goes on. Uh, I'll show you when we get there. Okay so that's how that turned out. Um, I'm just doing the top side first at the moment. I thought it might be wise to do one side completely, like follow it all the way through to you know drilling the holes and gluing the other bits on top here. Just in case there's something I come across that's um, that I could do better the next time because this is the top of the wing here but the important one really is the bottom which is going to be taking all the tension when it's in, in flight. So I want to get the next one done as nicely as I can. But anyway, uh, the surface actually not not too bumpy there. I mean, there's obviously there bumps there where you can see the circular discs, which is quite handy actually. I can see where they are. Although when, when I take this peel ply off, I'll be able to see where they are anyway. Um, but yeah, I'll just trim around here. And as far as airflow goes, I mean, we can't avoid it sort of being a bit bumpy there, but. All things considered, that's probably the best that could be done. To drill the threads out of the inside of these nuts, I started off trying to use the drill press vise, and it was very fiddly to get it in there in the right place, and it would kind of slip out, and the pressure required to keep it in, in there and um, stable while the drill was drilling was so much that it kind of crushed the nut a little bit, and while it would be sort of usable like that, I mean, nobody likes to have their nuts crushed, right? So I made this little jig and the idea is that, well that turned out to be much more difficult than I thought. My fancy little jig only lasted one nut. It did the first one beautifully. And then the second one, it just started getting rounded out inside there. I'm not sure if it was the heat that started that or it might have just been a little bit too loose fit anyway. Uh, and then it got stuck on there, almost felt like it was welded onto the tip of the drill. But anyway, so I changed a few things um, and seems like the best way to do it it's just to use a pair of pliers and hold it in the pliers. That's not going to crush it because my hand is not strong enough to crush it in the way that the vise was. Also I slowed the speed down on the drill by changing the pulleys, which I probably should have done to begin with. Um, and also use some of that. And finally we're getting through them quite nicely. So this is how that looks after tidying up a little bit. It tends to catch, the edge tends to catch on there, well it doesn't at the moment because I'm able to lift like that. but when the other side goes on it's going to catch a lot because one side or the other is going to catch, put it that way. So it's not going to be as easy as what I just did there, but uh, fits on there quite nicely, managed to get those holes in the right place, slides off fairly cleanly as well. And so the next thing to do is glue the other uh, bits on here and then we should be done. 
to make a cover for this electronics hatch here I just plugged that up with some foam and a bit of the uh, putty and sanded it smooth and I'm just going to slap some packing tape on here and then some fiberglass and a nice big square so here's the result of that <laughs> the world's easiest layup just slap some glass on there couldn't have been simpler uh, it turned out alright but it is unfortunately heavier than I had hoped for how many times have I said that now but it weighs about 80 grams so that's six layers of 100 gram glass and then a 50 so 650 grams total uh, may have been a little bit too much but even uh, even so the bit that I put on here I put 800 grams on there and it feels th a little bit thinner and lighter and I think maybe it's because I used 100 gram glass which is a little bit coarser so my theory is that there's more gaps like the glass on the glass doesn't sit as close as it would with 50 gram glass so there's more space for the resin to fill I think because it also took up a lot more resin than I expected as well um, but the reason I did it with the 100 gram glass is because I have so much of it and I'm just trying to use it up um, I'm almost tempted to do it again with 50 and see what difference it makes um, because it used, yeah, like it used twice as much resin as I thought it would. So to follow up on the world's easiest layup job, we're also going to have the world's easiest magnet attachment job. So I made some little holes around the corners and the sides there, which are deep enough for two of these magnets actually. And the way this is going to work is we'll put some epoxy microspheres in the hole, just a little bit, and then we'll put one magnet in the hole and a little bit more epoxy microspheres on top of that and then we'll put some plastic wrap across everything and then a little bit of 50 gram glass and then on top of the 50 gram glass we will put the other magnet but we have to hold the one that's in there down with a little bit of like something non-magnetic otherwise as we approach the one that's in there is going to yank itself out and ruin our careful preparation uh, so then on top of that we'll go a little bit of normal epoxy and then just lay the uh, piece on top of there and uh, should be quite nice and it will stick, yes it will stick to this because I had the foresight to put some peel ply on these corners so I did think a little bit ahead this time unfortunately these magnets because I put magnet on magnet instead of just magnet on a piece of steel they're actually quite strong <laughs> and you need to pry with a little bit of wood or a propeller or something to get them off but they do sit in there quite nicely and there's like almost no seam here no seam here which is the important part but I will put a little bit of something over here as well I think just so that there's a physical barrier other than just the magnets I was just running these motors for a while that are fairly just sort of a little bit above idle just to see because I, I noticed that one of the ESCs was warming up more than the other one and I was just wanting to check if there wasn't something wrong with it. I think they're okay. They're, they're not that much different but there's definitely a slight difference which is uh, hopefully okay. But anyway, I discovered an interesting phenomenon that I wasn't really expecting. Um, you can see the prop there is most of the width of this section here and as it was running I held my hand along here just to feel how much air was coming past and all the way along here I could feel air rushing back like that but on the top I could feel it here but as I got to about here I couldn't feel anything it was almost like there's just dead air nothing moving at all even though that's still behind the prop disc um, so what I'm thinking is that maybe the difference is that on the bottom there's a wall here which stops the air going that way and on the top, there's, there's nothing at the top that stops the air from going in towards the center of the fuselage. And the props are spinning in, like, like they'd be spinning like that. So they're pushing the air sideways as they come over the top. Um, which is interesting, yeah. But um, it's quite nice that we're going to have lots of air coming on the bottom of the flaps here, because we want that. And it's also kind of nice that this air will be pushed in a little bit towards the vertical stabilizer and the horizontal stabilizer a bit too, maybe. 
Well, it's another couple of months later now, and I haven't got much done on this considering how much time has passed. I've mostly just done the wiring, so that's the ArduPilot set up there. It's a bit of a mess. I'll explain that once I've put it into the plane. And also made up all these long cables that are going to be necessary for the servos. Uh, just sort of a bit of soldering and crimping on those, like that. And for the wings as well there. Those ones in there. Servos in the wings, all ready to go. Uh, motor wires sticking out there and actually the reason for the delay by the way is uh, I've got this new toy over here and I've been spending a stupendous amount of time playing around with that and the reason I got that was because this MIDI controller that Mr. Kohagen made me buy uh, just wasn't really cutting it in terms of the ability to put input enough inputs at the right timing and sequence but this format is much more conducive to getting everything right so if you think about it, this is all Mr. Kohagen's fault, really, how behind this project is getting. Um, but yeah, I thought I'd just turn my camera on now and share a little tip that I had, because I actually made up these servo cables about a month ago, and I've been putting off getting them stuffed down this channel inside the wings, because I knew it was going to be difficult. At least it was until I came up with this cunning plan. Um, so the way I was doing it, or trying to do it before, was just to use this M3 nut, and I would drop that in like through here and hold the plane up the right way so that gravity would just pull that down there and then I could bring it out here and then tie on the servo cable to pull that through or whatever but as more and more cables got put in here um, gravity wasn't letting that fall through because it was just too many cables because like we got two 14 gauge wires for the motor servo cable for the ESC then we've got servo cable for the aileron and then there's a flap that comes in from about here somewhere to there and it was getting pretty busy um, but what I came up with is uh, just a little bit of precision sellotaping on the end of this carbon rod with a magnet and then you can use gravity to get the nut into from here into about here where the channel goes and then just poke this in from the end where I do have pretty good access to and around about here it would, the magnet would pick up that nut and there's just enough friction or lack of friction rather to get it all the way through here fortunately I think one more servo cable inside that channel and I wouldn't have, been, wouldn't have been able to do this but fortunately I did manage to get everything through so they're all coming out there nice, nicely just the right lengths there lovely I also made this little mounting plate for the flight controller <laughs> that's about the only other thing I've done uh, the plane is very close to being flyable now though I just got to stick all that stuff in there which shouldn't be too hard I haven't quite figured out where the GPS and the receiver are going to go but there's there's plenty of room. Um, I actually have to do a little bit more soldering now though, unfortunately, because it kind of slipped my mind that this um, servo or the control cable <coughs> for the ESC there has to go through the back of this cage um, and come out here. And it's not detachable in the same way that the ESC itself is. These power wires, I can just detach them, that's no problem. Um, but I'm going to have to cut that and put it through here and then re-solder it. I don't really want to have a, another plug here, um, like a plug, like these ones. Just trying to keep those to a minimum. And the fact that the whole plane can fit in my car without having to take this section apart kind of makes me want to just solder everything up to that point instead of having plugs. Actually, I think I'll just show you this stuff here at the bench. might be a little bit easier before I put it into the plane. So this piece came directly from Big Red, pretty much unchanged, which is nice. It was long enough to reach from the battery to the electronics area at the middle of the wing, and that meant that I did not need to make any of this again, which is kind of nice, because that would have been a bit of a hassle. And it has a power module made by Mausch, I think you say that. And this has a 100 amp current sensor, Hall effect current sensor there, pretty nice one and 5 volt back. I'm just using this to power the flight controller and coming up from that we have here also uh, so this is a 5 volt output and the little yellow wire is the analog current sense um, connection. The flight controller is an Omnibus F4 Pro of course running ArduPilot of course and uh, this flight controller doesn't have enough outputs to run all of my nine things so I've got two ESCs and seven servos um, there's only four outputs available from here normally, or six I think you can actually get. Um, so in order to run this we are going to use an SBUS mixer and this little yellow wire here is carrying SBUS output 
from the flight controller to the SBUS mixer, which is going to then determine what each individual servo should do based on the configuration that is set up on the SBUS mixer. These little boards here are made by Matec and they are sort of a PDB, a BEC or a PDB, whatever. And they are taking full battery voltage, which is going to be coming in from one of those other plugs that we just looked at a moment ago. And they'll bring that into each one of these and they'll step that down to power the servos. And the reason I wanted to use these was, was a few reasons actually. One was just the convenience of having these rails here like that. And they're all already sort of heading off in the direction that they need to go. So this, this one, the bottom there, is for the tail of the plane. So there's three servos in the tail, two in each wing, and an ESC in each wing. Uh, so it's just a convenience for the plugging and layout of everything. Uh, another reason is redundancy, because if I wasn't doing it this way, I'd probably be running all of my servos off one beck. And if that dies, then you've got no servos. And at least this way, if one of them dies, You'll still have some servos, hopefully, and you might still be able to land the plane properly if you're lucky. Uh, and another reason to use these is that you can use a different voltage than 5 volts for your servos. So because none of the servo current or power is coming into these uh, these two boards here, flight controller, um, the voltage can be different. So there's a little um solder bridge there that you probably can't see very well but you can set this to 6 volts or 7.2 volts and I've set it to 6 volts so all my servos are running at 6 volts and it means that none of the none of the current that powers the servo needs to go through the PCB of of the flight controller or, or the SBUS mixer um, so if I wasn't doing it this way all of these plugs instead of being nice sort of separate separated out here they'd all be crammed into one place in here and this power for all of those seven servos would be running through the traces on the PCB, and I just didn't really feel like doing that. It probably would have been all right, but uh, I think I'll <laughs> I prefer it this way. Uh, over here we have a Bluetooth module. This is for telemetry, and this is hopefully going to be more convenient because my laptop has Bluetooth built in. Normally what I would do is use one of these things, and these are quite good because they have much more range than Bluetooth, so even up to hundreds of meters away you can still see the data, and um, I don't know if you're supposed to be able to make settings while the plane is flying. I've given it a try sometimes, and it doesn't seem to work, so I think maybe Agipilot just doesn't let you do any settings while the plane is armed and flying. Um, but anyway, this is a little bit of a hassle because I have to take one of these with me, with my laptop, and... That's what this Velcro is here for. I stick it on the back of the laptop, and it's just a bit of a hassle to, to have to carry this around, whereas if you're using Bluetooth, at least in my case, it's built into my laptop. Um, and I've found that I don't really need to change settings on the fly, um, so what I'll be doing, hopefully, is to land and then change settings. And it's still a bit of a hassle to have to open up the hatch and plug in your USB, because you have to get your com computer right over close to the plane so that the USB cable can reach. But with this, um, it should make life a bit easier because you just need to get within sort of 15 meters or so of the plane. Um, over here we have a GPS. This is a BN220. Should be good enough. They've performed quite well for me in the past. I did actually buy this other GPS over here, which is a rather more fancy one. Much larger, if you look at the size difference there. And I bought this mainly because I was curious to how it would perform. And it wasn't super expensive. It was a 50 US dollars, so... Not that cheap, but only like twice as much as one of those. Um, and I checked it out, and it performs very, very well. Basically about the same as the M8P, if you saw any of my experiments from last year. So it's as good as the best one that I had already. But then it occurred to me that uh, rather than using this on a plane, which doesn't really need to be super precise about its posi positioning, I would be better off using this on a ground vehicle where if you're going to, for example, go through a gate, you need to be much more precise precise about your location. So I think I'll just set this aside and maybe make some sort of a ground vehicle with that some point in the future, maybe. Um, on here we have a little RGB LED thingy like that. And this is for the the status, what do they call it, the status display or something for ArduPilot. If there's some problem, it will blink red, and if you've got good GPS lock, it'll blink green three times or something like that. And this is strong enough to be visible through the hatch on the top of my plane because it's slightly transparent, being just fiberglass. Um, so I thought it'd be nice to be able to see this from inside 
um, without having to take the hatch off. So that's that's what this is for. Turns out that one of these LEDs was perfectly bright enough, so I didn't really need three, but I had these little boards to use. They don't want to focus, do they? There we go. So these are the um, WS2812 or whatever, addressable RGB LEDs, NeoPixels or whatever. Quite cool. And finally, we have this receiver, which is FSIA10B. Didn't really need to be this flash um, because we're only using iBus for that output there. We don't need all those pins there, but this was the one that was on Big Red, and I'm kind of recycling all Big Red's parts here as much as I can, so that's why we ended up with that receiver. And for FPV gear, I think I'm going to use this. I uh, haven't quite decided on this, but probably go with that and one of these little antennas. Haven't used one, haven't used these yet. I just got this the other day, but hopefully it will be all right. And the camera is going to be this grubby old <laughs> Runcam 2. Still works great though. To attach the ESCs, I used the same method as for Big Red, which is a piece of soft wire that goes through the wing and then twists down on top of the ESC to hold it in place. And this wire would cut through the thinner skin of the fiberglass, so that's why I put these little discs of FR4 epoxied into place there so that the uh, wire couldn't pull sideways. The ESC is going to go here behind the motor. That wasn't really the original plan, but due to the way that the ESC is fairly large and these, the length of these wires and the placement of them, I couldn't really put it inside here in, in this cage, which was the original plan. Uh, and I didn't really want to have it on top because it would stick out quite a bit into the airflow. Uh, I guess not a bad thing for cooling, but I think it'll get just as much cooling back here as it will there. And also I like the fact that this is mostly almost within the like the profile of the motor if you look at it from the front. It doesn't really stick out that much. And this little bit of wire here was going to be sticking out here anyway because that's just the way the motor is made. Um, the original ESCs I wanted to use were these, um, what are they called? I can forget what they're called, but they're much smaller, more modern than the Hobbywing Skywalker 50 amp ones that I'm going to be using. Decided to go with those because I use them on Big Red and they were pretty solid and reliable and I already knew how they worked and the current draw characteristics of them and I like the fact that they have this massive big cooling thing. How can this here possibly handle, this is a 55 amp you see, the little one, and this is rated at 50 amps, the older style one. How does that work? For the control linkages on this plane I wanted to have something that was stronger and sturdier than the typical options that I would use for a smaller plane but I didn't really feel like spending money on buying any of the uh, stronger options. So I thought maybe I could use my CNC machine to make something that was strong and light and that's what I've ended up with here. Not sure if it's a super great way to do it, maybe in the comments you could tell me uh, how I could improve this, but basically we have two pieces of 1mm FR4 machined to be a certain length. So one of the disadvantages of this is that you can't adjust the length once you've made it, although since I have the machine I can just make another one slightly longer. And also using the SBUS mixer, I can be very precise about where I position the endpoints of each control surface, so it doesn't really matter that much. And then in between them we have a 2mm carbon fibre rod, and that's just super glued in there. I have since found that they come unstuck a little bit, so I will put some epoxy down the side there as well, just to make sure that they don't fall apart. Um, but the way it's made, it, they could actually come unstuck, and it probably wouldn't matter. So the way that you would use these is you put this in there and we end up with something a little bit like that and then you'd use heat shrink to finally hold that piece of wire in place um, and I also like that this goes straight down so typically what you'll find is that your servo push rod is pushing a little bit at an angle because the push rod is on one side of the servo horn right and I didn't really like that especially for something that needs to have quite a lot of power in it, like the flaps linkage. This one's probably fine, but for the flaps I didn't really want to have it sort of askance the way that uh, it would normally be. So anyway, this is what I've ended up with. They're very light too. Another nice thing about these is that you can get them really slop free. So that's I'm lifting the whole side of the plane here just on the um, linkage without any any play. And you do that by making this hole a little bit too small and then I used a cordless drill with an end mill in it to slowly enlarge that hole until it was just big enough for these little bits of steel wire to get through. Okay, here's all that wiring in the plane and running with all the blinking lights going. It's a... Uh, looks a bit messy but it's not cramped, there's plenty of space for everything. 
and there's really nothing much up there. I'm thinking I could actually put the GPS up the front because um, I still haven't stuck these in, they're just sitting there to be decided where they'll go and that thing there as well. But it all fits in there pretty nicely. For some reason these aileron servos are quite jittery. I'm not really sure what that's all about. They're a different type of servo to all the other ones. Well they're a JX, a 17 gram servo I think. The ones I have in the, in the flaps here are also JX and then the tail is um, those Racer Star ones, the cheapies. They're dead silent. So I don't know why these aileron ones are twitching like that. I thought maybe because it's such a long run of wire maybe they're picking up some interference from being squashed right up close against the other wires that go through here. So I've got ESC wire, signal wire rather, and um, the wire for the flaps as well. But I took I took the cable directly from here into here so that it didn't have to go through that channel and still jitters. So the other possibility is that there's something wrong with my S-Bus Mixer programming that's not quite right, but that wouldn't ex really explain why those ones are silent. So I think I'm just going to um, not worry about it too much and just accept that this, these servos are always going to be a little bit jittery. Okay, so we've got all that set up. All the uh, center points and end points are ready to go. We've got Looks like the center point for the rudder is a little bit off. I didn't, maybe I screwed that up. I'll have to come back and do that again. It's not quite going back to the center, is it? See? Uh, and then we've got motor, motors rather, and we've got flappage. So that's uh, half flaps, probably a little bit far actually for half flaps. Take off flaps, whatever. And that's full flaps, which is probably also a little bit too far. Uh, yeah, so I might actually come back and tweak all those things a little bit again and I also want to add I want to have a little bit more movement on the ailerons so I'll have to change the position of the control horn pin where it goes through other than that though the plane is now ready to fly although it can't fly without being launched <laughs> and I can't launch it like this so I'll have to make a dolly I think for it to launch off I probably will make some proper undercarriage for it that stays on there permanently at some point if it flies well I just want to see if it flies well first though, and I don't want to commit to the undercarriage until I've done that. So, um, yeah, in the next video, hopefully we'll fly it in the next video. How many times have I said that now? But all it needs now is a dolly to launch off and some not raining weather. Um, so hopefully, yeah, we'll fly it in the next video. Until then though, thanks for watching. See you next time.